In today's episode, we are going over how I get my patient's quads back after major knee surgery, a guide for physical therapists. Let's roll. So what's the problem with quads? Why are we talking about quads? Well, if you're a physical therapist, you know this, right? The quads get weak after an injury. So most notably, if you have an ACL injury, or if you have some sort of major meniscus injury, your quad just turns into a bowl of mashed potatoes, right? You also see this after a uh, quad or patellar tendon rupture. It just doesn't fire anymore, right? It's not attached. Um, and then after a surgery, it's, it gets even worse, right? So I think it's important to understand that the injury itself is going to cause weakness, inhibition, right? And then once you have surgery, it gets even worse, right? It's just like digging this hole and it gets deeper and deeper in terms of weakness, right? Um, atrophy. Not a lot of good things are happening after an injury like this, right? And I think the problem with physical therapists is that getting this strength back is very, very challenging. Getting the muscle mass back is very, very challenging. And I think we have a very tall task because you just know that it's it's not something that comes back easily, right? And the other problem is it sometimes never comes back. And I've certainly seen this a lot for a lot of folks, right? They just, they have a knee surgery and 5, 10, 15 years later, they still have a weak quad and it does happen. And it's probably not a good thing, right? Having your quads stronger is important as a predictor of whether or not you're going to be able to turn back to sport at a similar rate, influence your re-injury rate, right? So we got to get the quad back on board. Now, I want to just read this stat for you because I'm a big evidence guy. And some of these stats can be a little bit shocking. So if you're not really aware of this, this is coming from a study. I'll make this a little bit bigger so I can see it. Oh, didn't do it right. Let's go back here. So this is from the Journal of Science and Medicine Sport, 2016. Muscle atrophy contributes to quadricep weakness after ACL reconstruction. Uh, if you're watching Instagram Live right now, I apologize, not going to be able to see this. But if you go over to YouTube's Facebook, all this information is going to be there. So from the study, quadricep weakness is nearly ubiquitous following ACL, ligament, injury, and reconstruction. Strength deficits upwards of 30% in the reconstructive compared to the contralateral limb have been reported six months postoperatively, right? It's actually kind of conservative. Deficits in muscle mass symmetry are between 3 and 7%. And this is 6 to 18 months after surgery. So pretty far removed from when most folks are continuing with physical therapy. They're going to have deficits in strength as well as muscle mass. And some research even shows that these deficits are as high as 18% side to side. This is six years after surgery, right? So this is a tremendous problem. So in today's episode, we're going to talk about my strategy for rebuilding the quads. And we're going to talk about what to do pre-op because oftentimes pre-op is super important, but we don't always get the opportunity to do pre-op physical therapy with our patients. It's a little bit more common in the ACL, right? A lot of docs are sending their patients to PT prior to ACL reconstruction. A lot aren't. It's not a good thing, right? But I bet you this is going to be a problem in folks have any sort of major knee injury. We just tend to have a lot of research on the ACL. My gut tells me that for meniscus repairs, right, for any sort of, let's say, major knee ligamentous injury besides ACL, it's probably going to be important. Um, cartilage injuries, probably going to be important. We should be doing some sort of rehab before folks go into or into surgery. We probably need to make sure that quad is coming back, the range of motion is coming back before we have surgery. Okay. And we'll talk about uh, post-op rehab and maybe some little of the advanced rehab. Uh, we'll talk about exercise selection, which exercise we like to use, the frequency. We'll talk about mobility. And we'll talk about modalities you can use, things like blood flow restriction training or NMES, right? A lot of cool things, little tips you can try that improve your long-term outcomes. I want to give a big thank you to Owen Gillum. He's a physical therapist I met before, great guy. Um, and he actually gave me this question, but the question was about rebuilding quad strength. And the problem that he's seen is that he's doing a really good job of rehabbing his patients to the point where the contralateral limb or the opposite side knee is getting much stronger than a surgical side, despite the surgical side getting better, better, better. The contralateral is actually getting better, 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 but faster ends up being a problem. And what I will say is that I think what's happening in that situation is that you don't have accurate measurements of what the prior quad strength is, right? So let's say post-op ACL, you do quad strength measurements at week eight, right? I'm just making that up, but let's say that's when you measure it. And you notice that the quad on the um, non-op side is 100 
and the quad on the upside is 50. I'm just making these numbers up, right? Over the course of time, the operative side goes up to, let's say, 75, 80. But you'll notice that non-op side goes up to 150. So now all of a sudden, you're seeing an even bigger deficit. And then you measure again in a couple months, and then maybe the quad on the operated side is 100, but that non-op side is 200, right? So what happens is that contralateral side is getting stronger, 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 right? What I will say is that you probably just don't have accurate measurements in terms of what that person's optimal quad strength is. So we'll talk about this a little bit later, but you probably want to get measurements beforehand. And do keep in mind that if an athlete is not already following a strength conditioning program prior to starting a physical therapy program after, let's say, an ACL reconstruction, those numbers are probably garbage, right? So those the contralateral limb measurements are not going to be phenomenal because that person's nowhere near close to their genetic potential for their quad strength. So you're going to see that number sometimes get bigger over the course of time. And just keep in mind that you've got a really large mountain to climb. Uh, and I'm going to show you all the strategies you can kind of employ. And I would recommend being a little bit more aggressive without aggravating or injuring the injury site after surgery, right? That's obviously very important. But I recommend being a little bit more aggressive in your strengthening strategy early on. And if someone is showing they're doing great, then you can always back off, right? But always start with a little bit more just knowing that there's going to be a lot of folks that are going to have trouble further out. Okay. Boom. And before we get started, just want to let you know about my fitness pain-free mini course. So if you like the information that you're learning about from me, this is the next logical step. It's a free course. Um, I'll put a link in the show notes. You guys can check it out. Uh, if you're watching Instagram live right now, there's a link in my profile and the highlights. You can check it out. We go over how traditional school has failed us. I love PT school. It's phenomenal, but it just gives us the basics doesn't give the advanced strategy you need to be in, let's say, a sports physical therapy facility or work with folks in the strength and fitness world like I do. We go over seven reasons why people get hurt in the gym. If you don't know why folks get hurt in the first place, it's actually a lot harder to rehab them and keep them from getting hurt again in the future. We'll go over why I think folks are getting hurt. We'll go over four simple steps for getting your clients out of pain. It doesn't have to be that complicated. I'll break it down make it super simple for you how to earn the career of your dreams and earn the respect of your community. At the end of the day, the reason why you're probably listening to folks like me and trying to get better as a physical therapist and a coach is because you want the folks that you work with to respect you. You want to be able to help them. You want to be admired within your community. I'll show you how to do that. All right. So check it out. Link in the show notes, uh, free mini course. And if you sign up for the free mini course, you also get automatically enrolled into a waiting list for the fitness pain free certification. This is the complete comprehensive certification I wish I had when I finished up with PT school, right? I'm trying to accelerate your career 10 years or so. I'm going to bring you up to snuff with everything you need to know to be an expert working with the strength and fitness population. Certification opens for enrollment four times per year for one week period. Next enrollment's in around six weeks or so, right? It's going to be in the beginning of April. And if you do enroll, you'll be uh, given access to the certification one week early and you save 300 bucks. So quite a bit cheaper. Recommend checking out the mini course. And again, I recommend checking out certification. So back to the question. We want to get these quads back on board. How do we do it? Well, first and foremost, I think this starts prior to surgery. Okay. Got to get the quad going before you start having your surgery. Uh, unfortunately, we have a lot of research to show that this is a very effective strategy, but not a lot of doctors are actually doing this. And that's a bit of a problem. So this study is from American Journal of Sports Medicine, 2016. Uh, so a good journal, right? Uh, from Phyla et al. I'm probably saying that wrong. I, I apologize. But if you apply a progressive strength and neuromuscular training program, right? And in this study, they had 10 PT visits after someone had an injury, consisted of getting their range of motion full, right? So getting symmetry between sides, getting swelling down, getting the quad lag down. So if you don't know what a, a quad lag is, essentially, if you're performing a straight leg raise, so laying on your back, legs as straight as you can get it, lifting that leg up to, let's say, 45 degrees of hip flexion, you shouldn't notice any dropping or knee flexion during that movement. And if you have a breaking of that full extension, if the knee flexes slightly when you lift up, that's known as a quad lag. So you want to get rid of that. And they were also doing neuromuscular control training, perturbation training. So essentially, just balancing while someone messes with you. Uh, to try to knock you off balance. So working to restore balance after surgery. These folks had better outcomes and better return to sports two years after surgery. And I think this is amazing because a little bit of work prior to surgery is going to reap big benefits two years after surgery. Okay. So if your patients are not getting this sort of care prior to surgery, unfortunately, we don't always have the ability to do this. I think they should. 
So if you're getting people direct access coming through the door after you have a major injury, oftentimes I'm talking to them, say, hey, you may have a major ligament injury. Definitely want you to see the doc, get this checked out, but you have to rehab prior to going to surgery because we know that's going to help you out a bunch. So it's an educational component for all my patients. We make sure they know about this prior to having surgery. Okay. Um, and these are some guidelines coming from the University of Delaware. I really like those folks down there. They do a great job with their protocols. Uh, I'll leave a link in the show notes. So you guys can check that out. Um, so basically their goals from a physical therapy perspective, and this is for pre-op ACLs, although I think these are actually really good goals for any sort of knee injury that's going in for surgery, is that they want full active range of motion and passive range of motion into knee extension. Okay. I think that's very, very important. They want their knee flexion range of motion within 10 degrees or so of the contralateral side. So not quite complete, but close. Looking for trace to zero knee effusion. So all that swelling should be largely gone. There should be very little knee um, swelling going on. You want no knee extension lag with a straight leg raise. And we're looking for a quadricep strength index greater than or equal to 80% of the uninvolved side. So it's important that you're strength testing these folks. I have some videos you guys can check out if you want to see how I test the quad, right? Uh, you should be doing this prior to surgery, and we should be hitting a benchmark of at least 80%. Uh, if you want to be picky, make it better. Get to 90%, right, prior to surgery. That's going to help you in the long term, okay? And the other part is that if you're able to, you should gather pre-op strength data, okay? So if you are going to measure the contralateral quad, and you do it right after that person has an injury, right? That's going to be the most true measurement of their quad strength, okay? You can use that as a benchmark for future PT because what's going to happen is that you have an individual that has an ACL tear, and then they start doing a little bit of PT for the injured side prior to surgery, and then they have surgery, and you strengthen them for, let's say, eight weeks and do PT for eight weeks, the contralateral limb, the side that didn't have surgery, is also going to get weaker for that, let's say, two to three month period. And if you're relying on that measurement of that contralateral limb as a measurement of what you want to get that quad back to on the surgical side, it's not accurate. Okay. So you have to keep that in mind. So if you're able to get measurements of that contralateral limb prior to surgery, that's helpful. Okay. So let's go over some strengthening strategies. And I think these strengthening strategies are going to be important pre op post-op, early stage and advanced stages, I think the thing you have to be aware of is that we're often protecting either an injury, right? So when you have a pre-op ACL, I'm not going on the field and doing cutting drills with them. I don't want to risk injuring the meniscus or something else, right, prior to having a surgery. So you have to keep that in mind with your exercise selection. Early on, after someone has ACL reconstruction, we have to protect the graft location. So where are they taking that graft from? Is that going to be from cadaver? Is that coming from hamstring, quad, patellar, right? We have to make sure we don't aggravate that graft site early on. We also have to make sure that we have to um, protect the actual ACL, right? Because after you have surgery, if you're going crazy with open chain knee extension exercises, we may promote a little bit of laxity, right? You know, jury's still out. If you guys want to hear my thoughts on that, I did a whole episode on it. You can check it out. <clears throat> but we have to protect the area, uh, both the injury and also the reconstruction after surgery. So take this all with a grain of salt, but all these principles are going to apply before surgery, right after surgery, those intermediate, and also those advanced phases, okay? So the first thing that I want to utilize, and this is most effective immediately after the injury and also immediately after surgery, is going to be neuromuscular electric electrical stim, okay? So what this is, you put pads on the quad, and then you basically crank this up as high as the patient tolerates, but at least in most of the ACL research, you're trying to get 50% of MVIC of the quads, right? <laughs> Which is actually very, very high. So what I'm trying to do with my folks is, is pump it up as high as they can tolerate. I'm not actually setting them up, testing their quads, seeing what they can maximally produce, then using 50% of that with stim, which is, you know, ideally what you would do. I'm just trying to crank this up as high as a patient can tolerate, right? And in this study, right, and this was from Hauger et al. in 2018, they showed that NMES, in addition to standard physical therapy, appears to significantly improve quadriceps strength and physical function in the early post-op period compared to standard PT alone, right? And what you'll find in a lot of these studies so NMES studies, as well as BFR studies, is that this improves outcomes early on, but most folks kind of catch up later on. So let's say you don't use NMES or you don't use BFR early on, 
majority of folks are still going to do just as good long term. The problem I will say is that in research studies, they're looking at averages. Okay. So essentially, there's going to be outliers where their strength just doesn't come back. And I think for these folks, these strategies like NMES and BFR and using a higher frequency of exercises can be pretty helpful for them because these are the folks that might not like fall within the norms. Because I'm sure you guys, if you've been a physical therapist for long enough, you're going to find a few outliers that don't tend to get their strength back. Okay. And then for some of those folks that are kind of six, seven, eight, nine months out from ACL reconstruction or major, major like meniscus repair, you might be kicking yourself and thinking like, I kind of wish I did some BFR early on. Kind of wish I did some NMES early on. So I would say for these folks, I, I would just keep in mind, not everyone is going to fall to the norm. Not everyone is going to have those average results. So uh, interventions like NMES and BFR are, are very helpful, I think, for a lot of folks uh, early on and probably later on as well. But the average person is probably going to get better regardless of whether or not you use NMES or BFR, right? Boom. So this is another study. It's from arthroscopy in 2023, so a recent study. And um, I'm going to read the title for you, and that's all you really need to know. <laughs> Blood flow restriction therapy for two weeks prior to ACL ligament reconstruction did not impact quadricep strength compared to standard therapy. Okay. So this, this seems like a knock against BFR. In a lot of ways, I think it is. It's not like BFR seems to be superior to regular physical therapy. But here's the thing. When someone has a major knee injury, they often can't tolerate higher level exercises. They can't tolerate this stuff that's going to give them a good outcome, right? So if I have someone with a highly irritable knee, I can give them 20% of their one rep max, which is oftentimes very, very tolerable, and get a similar improvement in strength, hypertrophy, all that good stuff, compared to doing 80% plus loads, right, on an irritated knee, sometimes doesn't go well, right? So essentially, if I can use BFR, that's an option that works as well as high load strengthening. You're going to find some folks prior to surgery, they don't tolerate higher loads, okay? So we can get a decent effect with BFR in folks that are highly irritable. So it is a good option in folks that are not tolerating standard PT, okay? And here's another cool study. This was looking at post-op ACLs, right? And it's a systematic review. So take these with a grain of salt. They're taking a bunch of studies and lumping them together. Uh, essentially, it was International Journal of Sports PT, recent study, 2022, from Cock et al. Effect of low-load blood flow restriction training after ACL ligament reconstruction, systematic review. Conclusion was the result of this systematic review indicates that low-load BFR training after ACL reconstruction may be beneficial on quadriceps strength, quadriceps mass, and knee joint pain compared to non-BFR training with non-detrimental effects on ACL graft laxity, right? This goes back to my earlier point. So essentially, the literature is mixed on whether or not BFR is superior to regular strength training. And the other piece is that it seems like folks that don't do BFR tend to catch up later. So in essence, doing BFR early on will increase quad strength early on in short-term outcomes. But later-term outcomes, folks that didn't do BFR will kind of catch up, okay? So again, I think that BFR is probably a good idea early on for most of your patients, because when you look at these research studies, you're looking at averages, right? So essentially some folks won't catch up later on. So BFR is a nice option to get those folks that maybe wouldn't catch up without it up to, you know, a better pace a little bit earlier on. So that's why I like BFR. I think it's a good option for these folks. Okay. What other strengthening strategies do we have? Well, we can do contralateral limb training, and this is crazy. I think it's absolutely bananas. So Essentially, this study by Minshall et al., European Journal of Applied Physiology in 2021. And the study was called Contralateral Strength Training Attenuates Muscle Performance Loss Following ACL Ligament Reconstruction, Randomized Controlled Trial. And what they showed is that if you do hamstring and quad strengthening on the contralateral side, so the non-injured side, the non-op side, essentially these folks are going to have more strength on the surgical side, <laughs> by about 40% more than folks don't that don't do contralateral limb training, okay? This is absolutely bananas to me. So if you just strength train the non-op side, you have a 40% increase on the operative side, which is crazy. The other piece is that if you don't perform contralateral limb training, the folks that don't perform contralateral training, they still catch up, right? So in the short term, 10 weeks, uh, the folks that did the contralateral limb training, 40% increase in strength on the op side. But after 24 weeks, there's no difference in groups. 
So again, it seems like folks will catch up if they don't do the contralateral limb training, but think about the folks in the studies that don't catch up. I think this is actually kind of nice for them. So early on, you're probably getting a little bit of effect on that um, non-op side, which in some folks is probably going to lead to a better long-term outcome. Majority of folks, probably not, right? Uh, what I will say is that if you do contralateral limb training, you're going to skew that quad index a little bit just because you're getting the contralateral side stronger. And what's going to happen is the op side has to catch up. Uh, but what I will say at the end of the day, we want both sides strong, right? So if I'm going to get a benefit of doing the contralateral limb training uh, on the op side, I'm going to go for it, right? The other piece to keep in mind is that after a period of time, I start favoring the op side in terms of volume, right? Meaning that I will perform more sets on the operative side compared to the contralateral side. A really easy way to do this is that if you're going to be doing, let's say, three sets of 10 on a given exercise, you can do three to four sets on the op, on the op side. We're only doing two to three sets on the non-op side, okay? So you just skew it, put a little bit more stress onto the operative side. Just keep in mind the extra stress can set you back sometimes. If you overdo it, people get more swollen, more painful, more irritable. So it's definitely a balance. So in terms of exercises, what kind of exercise strategies can you implement? So... One of the things that I educate my patients on is that after you have a major surgery like this and prior to having a major surgery like this, you're going to war on your quad, right? So essentially, we know that quad is going to be super weak, and we have to be very serious, right, about doing a great job getting the quad back. So I tell patients this, and I tell them, look, you need to go to war on this. This is incredibly important, okay? If you don't do a good job on this, we know six, eight, nine months out, you're going to be weaker. That's a bad thing to influence your re-injury rates, right? It's going to influence your outcomes. We need to get this back, okay? So make sure patients understand this and they take it seriously. And the other strategy I like to use is guilty until proven innocent, right? So we just talked about all of these studies that show if I apply things like BFR, contralateral limb training, it's helpful in the short term, but maybe not in the long term, okay? So here's the thing. We don't know which folks are going to have that catch-up effect and which ones don't, okay? So what we do is we quad strength test frequently throughout the rehab period once we know it's safe, okay? So I'm not doing, you know, intense quad strength testing two weeks after someone has ACL or meniscus repair or multi-ligament repair just because I know the area is weak, right? It's not going to influence my outcomes if I know it's weak early on, right? And I'm probably going to run the risk of kind of pissing off the area if I do too much too soon in terms of testing, Usually push that off by, let's say, somewhere between four and eight weeks. Um, four is kind of on the early side, eight's on the late side. But I push it off a little bit because I know that I'm going to go to war on this thing regardless early on. I know it's weak. But if I'm around the six to eight week mark and I strength test, I'm like, this person's beyond or behind. I'm starting to think I need to take this even more seriously and push a little bit more. If I notice their strength index is actually looking really good at six weeks, I can let off the gas pedal a little bit. I know I don't have to be as aggressive. So you don't have to guess on this, all right? We don't have to use this research and, and just kind of guess based on the individual. Uh, we can be a little bit more objective. We can measure the quad and we can dictate how much more or less they need based on that, okay? Easy peasy. So what kind of exercise are we using? Um, <clears throat> so I use a lot of open chain. I use a lot of closed chain. I, lose, I use a lot of everything, right? And this is not an exercise selection lesson. I actually have a whole fitness pain-free show episode about that. You can check it out. I'll leave a link in the show notes. So if you want to use my favorite exercise for ACL, meniscus, all that stuff, I have a ton of resources on that. You can check that out. But essentially, I'm using things like quad sets, straight leg raises, short arc quads, supine knee extensions. These are very useful early on after injury or very useful early on after surgery when you can't put as much stress through that. I'm using a ton of closed chain exercises. These are quite safe in post-op ACLs. Just be aware of concomitant pathology. So what I mean by that is if you have a big old posterior meniscus tear and you do a whole bunch of heavy loaded squats that are deep, that's going to put a ton of stress on that meniscus, right? Despite it not putting as much stress on the ACL. So make sure you keep that in mind. Again, this is not an ACL lecture, but it's important to recognize you have to respect the injury, the specific type of injury and choose as extra, choose exercise that strengthen the quad that also don't kind of piss off the, the healing surgical site, right? So how about frequency? Let's talk frequency. How often do you do these exercises? <clears throat> so 
I think it really depends on the goals and it also depends on how far out this person is from a given injury, right? So early on, folks have a lot of inhibition after they have a major injury. Let's say you just tore the ACL or you're kind of in the early stages after ACL reconstruction. Um, I think you're mostly working on neuromuscle control. You're probably not working on pure strength, right? So generally speaking, I use a high frequency early on. What does that mean? I'm having my post-op ACLs perform things like straight leg raises, quad sets, easy stuff that doesn't stress the ACL graft very much. One to three times per day, even times up to every single hour, I'm having them perform things like quad sets, just trying to get the quad back on board, right? So essentially, I'm trying to improve motor control of the quad, get the body used to firing that well. Am I getting a pure strengthening effect? It's probably going to increase strength, but not because I'm, I'm working on strength in the traditional 80% of your one rep max thought, okay? It's more restoring neuromuscular control, probably reducing some of that inhibition, also improving that knee extension range of motion, all of that good stuff that comes with early frequent motion right after a surgery or an injury. As people start to progress, they're not as irritable. We're not as concerned about injuring the, let's say, injury or the graft site, whatever it is, meniscus, whatever was repaired surgically. We can focus on some higher loads. So let's say 70, 80% of someone's one rep max. And what I like to do is perform these movements a little less frequently. Makes sense. Probably need some recovery between bouts of stronger, higher level exercise, right? So my higher level loading is occurring more like two to three times per week, right? What I like to do on off days from higher loads is implement lower load stuff, okay? So it makes sense. I probably can't handle high load stuff every single day of the week. It's probably too much. It might irritate the knee. So I do some lower load stuff. And this is where high rep kind of pump stuff fits in pretty well. So think about sets of 15 to 25 pump sessions of, let's say, isolation exercises. And then another good option is going to be blood flow restriction training, just because we're not putting as much stress through the joints, right? Through the tendons, just because it's a lower load. However, we still get a similar effect with hypertrophy and strength. So usually I'm doing two to three days a week worth of um, kind of lower level exercises, BFR stuff, two to three times a week throughout the entirety of rehab process of higher loads and going a little more conservatively right after the injury, just not to aggravate that injury, right? A little bit less um, aggressively right after surgery, because again, we have to protect the surgical site, right? So how about hypertrophy? And this is a question I've received from other folks as well. Um, I think you have to be a little cautious with the hypertrophy literature. I think it's smart that people are looking at hypertrophy literature and trying to figure out what the best volumes, right, uh, are for folks or the best frequencies in order to promote gains and strength and hypertrophy, right? Uh, but I want you to keep in mind that a lot of this research is in healthy individuals. It's not in um, folks that are post-op ACL reconstruction. So in those folks, I bet you adding in more neuromuscular control exercises and additional sets from that perspective is probably going to lead to better outcomes as opposed to following what's optimal for someone that's healthy that doesn't have a fresh injury. Okay, so take it with a grain of salt. Obviously, we need some more research to figure that out. Um, however, we can use some of this research in healthy folks to guide us. This is a study from uh, Baz Val et al., 2022, so newer article in the Journal of Human Kinetics, uh, systematic review of the effects of different resistance training volumes on muscle hypertrophy. And they were actually looking specifically at the quadriceps as well as the triceps. Uh, and what they found is that according to the results of this review, a range of 12 to 20 weekly sets per muscle group may be an optimum standard recommendation for increasing muscle hypertrophy in young trained men. So you can utilize this as a guideline about how many sets you want to use for your individuals per week to improve strength and hypertrophy. Uh, again, take this with a grain of salt because this is young, healthy folks, right? So in the study, they had a low volume group, they had a moderate high or a moderate volume group, and they had a high volume group, right? And what they found was that the moderate and high volume volume groups outperformed the low volume groups, but the moderate and the high volume had no difference. Okay. So it's probably a bit of a ceiling effect for most folks. It's not like you can give them so much volume and every increase in that volume is going to give them exponentially more increase in strength and hypertrophy. And this is even more true in someone who's post-op, right? Just because if you throw too much volume at someone without enough recovery, you run the risk of really irritating the knee. And if you irritate the knee too much, it actually gets weaker, right? It gets weaker. You have more swelling. You have decreased range of motion. There's definitely an art to this. So I think for most folks, you can slowly start to increase the volume over the course of time. 
and just be on the lookout for symptoms. How is that knee responding? Is a range of motion continuing to improve? Is the swelling staying low or pain level staying low and improving over the course of time? And if you have a green light, you can kind of ramp up to that 12 to 20 uh, sets per week. Do keep in mind that this is traditional strength training. So in my mind, and they're not looking at things like BFR. They're not looking at, you know, neuromuscular control. Uh, I think that these are probably strategies and kind of sprinkle in on top of that 12 to 20 weekly sets per muscle group per week. Right. And you'll probably have an improved effect. Uh, also keep in mind that again, this, this research is looking at averages. The average person is going to do well with moderate to high volume. However, you may have an individual that needs a little bit less or needs a little bit more, right? It's very different based on the person. Good. And here's the thing. This, uh, this episode is already too long. I, I just ramble like crazy. When I first started these ass fitness <laughs> free show episodes, I was hoping I can get to like 10 to 20 minutes, like 20 minutes top. Here we are at 30 minutes. I'm not even finished right here. Uh, if you want specific examples of how I run, like basically A to Z, my rehab for these folks, I have them and I have them for post-op meniscus. I have them for post-op ACL reconstruction. I have that for pre-op, uh, folks. I have that for tendinopathy folks, quad, patellar. I'll leave some links in the show notes. If you want to see specific examples, how I write these programs, all there. All right. All that stuff is there. But just to give you a little bit of example of how I might run a training program for someone, let's say post-op ACL reconstruction. So like we alluded to earlier, I'm doing some heavier loading two or three days a week. So let's say Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'm doing my heavier loading. I'm doing my squats, lunges, step-ups, knee extensions, sissy squats. I'm trying to bias the quad a little bit through specific exercise selection. Again, this is not going to be uh, what I'm covering in this presentation. If you want to see how I increase the stress on the quads, I have a ton of information that on my website, Instagram, YouTube, just search for it. But I'm going to be doing somewhere between four, three and four sets between eight and 12 repetitions. Uh, some of those sets are going to be a little bit higher load. So maybe I'm going to be doing sets of five for my squats, sets of eight for my squats. And then for some of the isolation, I tend to go a little bit higher. So somewhere between eight and 15 for those. Then on my Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, so basically my off days, I'm doing some lighter load training. And usually I'm focusing on isolation on those days, right? So I'm focusing on the quad. I'm doing things like straight leg raises, long arc quads, short arc quads, more of those pump exercises. So think about trying to isolate that muscle, improve uh, neuromuscular control, get some blood flow into that area, but not putting too much stress through the tendons and through the joints by heavier loads with fast speeds. Tempo stuff is great on these days. Let's go a little more slowly. You can also mess around with isometrics on these days. They tend to be a little less stress on the joint, on the tendons, right? So those are some things you can try on these days. Typically, my set and rep ranges are higher. So four sets of 15 to 25, so more volume on these days at lower intensities. This is also a great time to consider using blood flow restriction training just because the loads are very low. So 20 to 30% of one rep max on average. Get a lot of stress from the muscle little less stress on the tendon, the joint, which is nice from a healing perspective. So trying not to aggravate the joint, right? Trying not to um, injure the ligament as it's healing, right? So as that ligament's going through the process of a process of ligamentization, and we don't want to put too much stress through it, it's kind of nice to put a little bit of stress, but not too much, right? And also this would be the time where I use NMES. So if I'm fresh after an injury or fresh after a surgery, this is the time when I'm applying a lot of NMES. I think NMES loses efficacy, efficacy over the course of time as neuromuscular control is reestablished. So maybe you're just using it for the first 8 to 12 weeks after surgery, right? The first 4 to 6 weeks after a fresh injury, right? And after that, you're transitioning to higher level exercise without NMES, right? So, and lastly, what I will say, and I, I already said this, but it's important to assess regularly, okay? Guilty until proven innocent. Assume that quad is weak until you find out it's not. Because we want to push the gas pedal until we know we don't have to anymore. Because if you don't push the gas pedal early on, right, we're not sure if someone's strength is being reestablished. We may miss that opportunity to improve that person's quad strength, okay? So measure frequently. I'd say every four weeks or so is probably a good way of doing it. If you measure every single day, that's probably a little too much. We don't need that, right? It takes too much time. There's a lot of things that are important from a rehab perspective. We've got to fit into a given session. So around every four weeks or so, you can always change, add more, add less, wherever it is over the course of time based on your results, okay? So <clears throat> again, if you like the learning that you're having throughout this lesson, I recommend you download the Fitness Pain-Free mini course. I'll leave a link in the show notes. You guys can check it out on Instagram right now. If you go into my profile under the highlights, it's free. Go 
over a lot of great stuff. Like I said, it's the next choice if you want to learn more from me, okay? And the last thing I want to open this up for is some questions, okay? So if you guys have any questions right now, put them in the comment section. Thank you very much for watching today. Um, if you have a, a question later, so if you're not watching this while it's live, just put a, a question in the comments, and I'll, I'll answer it via the comments, but I'll also, uh, if it's a good question, I'll just make a complete show about it, all right? So, like, the reason why I do these shows is because I want to answer questions you guys have. I want to solve problems within the physical therapy community. When it becomes, you know, the more specific to strength and fitness, the better. So, guys, just give me all the questions you have. I love them. I love answering them. Let me look at the my phone right now. Apologize, it's not going to look so nice in my room. We are remodeling. Let me see if anyone has any questions. Boom. Scroll up. Dan the man, what's going on? How are you? Daniel Quillen. Boom. Heads exploding. Love it when heads explode. <laughs> Corey, what's up? How's everyone doing? How's everyone doing? Boom, 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 boom. Nice. D-Bond. What's up, Dean? Nice. All right, cool. So it doesn't look like you have any questions right now. Let me see if anyone left anything right now before we wrap up. Oh, Harrison Norton. I'm a PT student in my last year of school. The information you share is super helpful. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Harrison. You're the man. Let me know if I can do anything else to help you out. All right. Boom. It looks like that's it. So we didn't receive any questions on uh, YouTube, so I'm going to get out of here. Uh, thank you very much for joining me. I really appreciate it. And uh, you truly allow me to do what I love, you know, follow my passion, and it's really cool. So thank you very much, guys, and I'll see you on the next episode, all right? Later.